how is everyone on Slush Day 2? So great to be here with you guys. We're going to talk about the future of growing our food today. Um, there are going to be about 10 billion people to feed on this planet by 2050, and already farming and growing our food supply is responsible for more than one-fifth of greenhouse gas emissions. So growing food and the, and the issue of climate change are inextricably linked. Um, so from assisting small-scale farmers to the future of creating, creating a hamburger that's never been alive, <laughs> um, we're going to talk about what the future of food looks like today. So back in 2014, you originally thought of Verdon as a mobile app to help farmers. How has it evolved into the, the text-based platform that it is today? Well, conceiving Verdant involved uh, looking at the sort of situation of agriculture, especially from where I come from, uh, uh, West Africa. And uh, the evolution happened from you know, building a precision farming mobile application to actually scaling it down to smallholders who do not necessarily have access to smartphones or even broadband to start with, and making it you know, in a small, a little chunk that they can understand and, and use uh, you know, in functional decisions on the farm. So farmers are able to text commands in and they get resources like financial information. Yes, so rather than your normal GUI, now we have farmers using text and voice. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, thing now, looking at uh, even Google's next one billion uh, customers probably coming uh, from that segment of people who do not have uh, you know, uh, access to either uh, smart devices or, or, uh, you know, or, or computers or smartphones. And largely, the farmers use text and voice to, to get information. Yeah. And at Meetable, there are, are so many companies getting into this alternative meat space now, but what is unique about the process that you guys are working on? Yeah, so I, I like to get back on what you said earlier, saying ma making a hamburger that was never alive, mm -hmm. but it actually is alive, right? They're, we're using cells, and cells are, are alive. Uh, so what's really different about us is the cell type that we use. We're using a very young, early stage in the development uh, cell type that is very prone to grow at large scale, uh, very easy to scale up. And what we have done is in collaboration with a spin-out from the University of Cambridge is finally being able to unlock the potential of this cell type because they were very hard to control. They are very hard to grow from a, a real stem cell into an adult muscle and fat cell. But with, together with the University of Cambridge, they've developed a technology that would allow us to differentiate, which means turning from a stem cell into an adult cell, within an unprecedented time, like five days, 100% efficiency. And to, in, to compare, the current status quo is doing this in 60 days and only like 10 to 15% efficiency. So finally, we're coming now into an age where we can make the promise of stem cells a reality. And that's what we're working on. Yeah. So what are some ways that Verdant is able to make these farmers more sustainable? Well, uh, sustainability is at the heart of what we do. We want farmers to grow food with uh, a, a full sense of economic, social, but also environmental value. So produce more with less effort, with also less ecological damage. Uh, a lot of the farmers that we uh, have been working on prior to now had no access to any form of uh, financial or otherwise management and uh, they basically grow what they can eat and can sell locally, which means they end up subsisting on it or probably not even having enough surplus to sell. So what we have been able to do is uh, to get them to conserve uh, resource and to get them to get more output from few input. And that, for me, uh, it, you know, is the basis of all sustainability. If you look at what they're able to save and, and the profit that they're able to make, and even uh, the, the yield that they're able to maximize. OK. And just cur out of curiosity, how many people here would choose to eat a burger that's been grown from a single cell? Raise your hand. <laughs> Nice, nice. That's, uh, that's a lot. Nice potential <laughs> customers, huh? <laughs> um, so obviously for a regular burger, you have everything that goes into raising a full cow. It takes about three years. Right. Um, so you have all of the, the water, the food, the land resources that go into that. But outside of, of those aspects, how does creating meat from a cell in a lab 
um, contribute to or it, mitigate the ecological impact? Well, if, you, if you're looking how many resources are going into raising a cow, really from the birth, uh, feeding it, uh, there is about 15,000 of liters of water necessary to get a kilogram of beef. And the conversion rate from grains to beef is 25 kilograms to one kilogram. And this is all also goes into the growth of the entire animal, right? You need to keep it alive. It has a, a body temperature. It roams around. And this all costs energy. It has internal organs, which we're not using. And you can very well imagine that if you have a cell and you're putting nutrients in to create more cells, that the conversion rate is much better. You can do this in a building. So you can actually make meat inside of a city instead of transferring transporting it from their surrounding areas in. Um, you only need like the, the tank where the cells are growing in. So it, the amount of emissions, the amount of resources necessary is diminished by almost 90 to 95 percent on all fronts. So it, it is so much better to be doing this, just growing the cells in a suitable medium. And basically, this is what uh, Winston Churchill has speculated on in uh, his paper called 50 Years Hence, mm -hmm. where he said, we'll be growing meat only the parts that is necessary in a suitable medium. We we're a bit late because he thought we might be done in 50 years. And it was in 1932 when he said this. But we're working on it. So we're trying to make this, uh, this statement still a reality. And what does the future of producing meat look like in your mind? I mean, is Meatable going to replace the cows that are being grown on farms now to, to be well, consumed? Well, if, if you imagine that the uh, current meat market is $7 trillion, so replacing this in the coming years is, I think, delusional. So. Um, I think you can just see it as a more diversification of proteins that people can uh, look for and eventually hopefully diminishing the amount of cattle that are being grown right now. But I think it will take a long time before we really get uh, rid of all the animals. And I don't think that's necessarily a desirable thing. I think uh, complementation would be key here because from mm. uh, a grain perspective, uh, you said it like uh, I read recently China eats more beef than the United States uh, uh, of America. and. Uh, the per capita meat uh, uh, intake in China is about 59 uh, uh, kg, as opposed to 30 years ago when it was just 9 kg. So you are dealing with people who currently probably have no beef, and you're giving them an alternative. So imagine a situation whereby, yes, there's cattle, but there's also beef, because uh, I mean, also cultured beef. Because to be honest, uh, it, it's not going to be enough. We need many more uh, alternatives. Right. right, we need everything. We need, we need plant-based, we need uh, uh, insects, we need cultured meat, we need to reduce our meat intake, because the problem currently is so big that there's not going to be a, a silver bullet that helps everything. We need to really do the, tackle this problem at multiple fronts and to make sure that it doesn't get out of hand, especially what you said about China, that they're now the middle class is getting more wealthier. And you can really see a nice correlation between the amount of uh, middle class or wealth uh, growth in the land and the amount of animal proteins that they take up in their diet. Mm -hmm. So I was also curious, I'm wondering, so how would you think that the, the, your, the Nigerians would view cultured meat uh, if we would bring this to the country, <laughs> right? Well, I'm not sure we'll get a lot of hands like we did at Slush, but definitely, um, I mean, you're dealing with people who have no uh, much protein intake. So it's like saying, OK, do you have meat? No. Uh, how about take this? So it's, 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 a, it's a viable alternative. I definitely believe that uh, you have a market, even Great. though. Uh, yeah. Good to hear. <laughs> so you're working now with about 10,000 farmers, and they're mostly growing crops rather than raising cattle. Um, but how are you equipping farmers, especially in these developing nations, who will first feel the impacts of climate change to deal with the, the changes that are coming? So farmers are, I think, the most prone to the tangible parts of uh, uh, climate change that not necessarily everybody in this room experiences. They go through, uh, you know, the floods and the droughts. You know, they are at the receiving end of climate change. And a lot of what we've been doing is to get them to see that this is a part of a larger kind of uh, chain reaction. And uh, to do that, you can't necessarily just start dropping papers and academic research on, on people who, you know, have probably no education. Uh, so a lot of what we've been doing is to uh, introduce products like uh, index-based, uh, uh, weather-based index insurance that sort of 
tries to peg their uh, their farms to either adverse weather um, or uh, uh, drought or flood, you know. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of interest in that they, they want to be safe because they do see the irregularities. This year, the rains start early. Next year, they start uh, late. Uh, sometimes there's a flood and sometimes there's a drought. And, and uh, they're suffering. You know, they are at the receiving end of it. So. And they also have a hard time securing finance as well, right, and, and insurance. So how does, does Verdant connect these stakeholders to the farmers themselves. Yeah, so the key uh, part of what we do is to help smallholders. And smallholders here, uh, I'm referring to uh, farmers who have maybe two hectares below. Uh, so really small pieces of land, and, and they depend on it. Uh, their families depend on it. So. What we're doing is trying to make them more visible. These people are mostly financially excluded, which means they have no form of bank accounts, no form of access to insurance, or any other type of finance. So what we're doing is to put them in a database and go to a bank and say, OK, here's a bunch of customers. Here are customers who need agricultural credits, agricultural ro loans, who need uh, uh, other types of financing. And that is basically what they need, because for a smallholder to leave their isolated remote location and go to a brick and mortar bank is nearly impossible. And that's why they've been so financially excluded for so long. Yeah. And so obviously you are on board with the cell grown, the cell <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, meat, right? but what do you say yeah. to the skeptics who might be opposed to that idea at first? Well, there is a, a nice thought experiment which I think a lot of people cannot get around. So if I would present somebody with two hamburgers and one was made from a real animal, right, with all the negative effects of the methane admission and the resource depletion, uh, and the other one was made with cell culture, and I would switch them around and I would eat, feed them to you, and you wouldn't be able to tell me the difference between one or the other, what would you choose? It, it seems to me like a very obvious choice, right? And if you if you have some sentiment of really thinking like, well, I really want an animal involved in my, the production of my meat, like a live animal, yeah, that, that's unfortunately a market I cannot <laughs> tailor to. But I do think that once you have something that is indistinguishable from the real thing, I think it's very easy for people to adopt it. And how long will it be before consumers can, can try a, a meatable burger? Well, we think we'll be at a demo stage, meaning we have a small-scale production uh, method validated in two and a half years. And after that, of course, we have to scale. And that's really important, because meat is so cheap nowadays that if you cannot do this at the tons of kilograms, then the price will never be on par with real meat. And we really think that's really important for adaptation. So then next, another two and a half to three years for a pilot, planned where you can expect this product in exclusive retailers, in restaurants, high impact events. Uh, and I also think that in this growth stage, you also can get more people accustomed to the idea. So once we finally have like a flagship plan that is really on the skill that we want to, that you have a nice base of people that are adopting this uh, new form of meat. And that will be another uh, three to four years. So in about eight years, we think this will could be in supermarkets for everybody eight years to buy it at, a, yeah, shelf, yeah. at a, re a reasonable price. Yeah. And speaking of scaling, from a global perspective, how do some of the concepts that you're using in Verdant to help these farmers scale to other countries, and how could this, I these data insights be applied to help sustainable farming across the globe? So I think uh, we started in Nigeria, all right, but the problem we are dealing with is almost uh, global because you have farmers not only in Africa, but in Asia and even other continents that uh, are isolated, that are not visible to, to, to markets and to you know, finance and, and especially to good agricultural practices. To, to, core knowledge that makes them you know, uh, produce better. So I, I feel uh, as soon as we're able to, to fully demonstrate the power of using agricultural data at such a small scale, then we would have uh, demonstrated to the world that 
uh, you could get smallholders to produce almost at a par with mechanized agriculture, which we believe is the only way currently to, to, to produce 70% more food mm -hmm. uh, for the 10 billion people you spoke about. And if you look at it, dealing with smallholder farmers, empowering them to produce better is actually healthier for the environment in that you do not have the greenhouse gas emissions at, at, at least not at the stage uh, or the proportions that we're talking about when we speak of uh, mechanized agriculture and also if you look at the uh, capacity or the potentials for using uh, environmentally healthy alternatives like um, uh, organic fertilizers and manures it's easier to do that with a smallholder farming type agriculture than uh, a large-scale uh, uh, farm that you know wants profit at all costs. But you really believe that that if you give these farmers the data, that's more important than increasing the infrastructure that they have access to. I, I believe the data has to come first. Infrastructure is key, but it's it's useless if it's on a bad decision. So. Uh, I, 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 I keep saying this, bad data leads to bad decisions. Now imagine what no data leads to. Imagine a situation where you build a railroad or an airport to transport a commodity that farmers grow. If the market doesn't want that commodity in the quantity or the quality that the farmer grows it, then your infrastructure in terms of the railroads and the airports you build are practically useless because no market will take the commodity in the quality and quantity that the farmers are growing it. So I believe infrastructure is key, but data come first. So, uh, sorry, I had a question. So how do you get the farmers to provide you with the data and to make sure that the data is good? Um, so, yes, it's a two-way thing, but first we provide the farmers with data. But uh, uh, in terms of smallholders, say in Nigeria, who use local languages, uh, they have a simple way of getting uh, in touch with us, as simple as texting a three-letter word like WEA for, for weather information. And then we know your geographic location. We know exactly where your farm is. Then we give you data tailored to that specific geographic location. And if you texted us about uh, a pest or you uh, uh, phoned in, then uh, we'll take the information and we know exactly where your farm is. And all the heavy lifting could be sort of done for you. And uh, in the near future, we probably have uh, an artificially intelligent mechanism to do that. But currently, we have uh, people uh, you know, helping with that. Amazing. So you're equipping these farmers with data that helps them make better decisions, know about the demand so there's less waste, they have better sustainable practices, um, and they're able to produce more to, to feed this growing population. Um, that's great. And, and as we've mentioned, the demand for meat is increasing as well. Um, so in countries where there's these emerging middle classes that are, that are asking for more meat, mm. um, how do you see Meatable fitting in, into filling that demand in the future? Well, I think it's much easier to get into a market where people are not very accustomed to having an, a, an overproduction of meat. Um, and this way, if you substitute it with something else, it can very early, it becomes like the standard, right? When you just have go to the supermarket, there's always has been a cultured meat section where you can pick your meat from. So it doesn't, it doesn't need to insert itself in between the shelves of the supermarket to start with. Mm -hmm. So I, de I think it will be easier adopted when you're doing this from the start, educate people from the start. I do believe this is very necessary to tell people the difference between uh, meat from an animal and cultured, why, why it's better to pick this choice and have people drawn to it from the start uh, and this way yeah just creating already a market where w there was none before and could you speak to how lowering the number of livestock being raised would affect farmers growing crops in uh, Nigeria. So yeah, I, I mean, this is a very crucial matter because there's currently competition b uh, in grain production. You know, some people want to take uh, farmland. By the way, uh, the global crop land under cultivation is about uh, currently 12%, and we have a limit. We should not go beyond 15% of uh, crop land uh, globally. We are at 12%. And if we are going to uh, ramp up agricultural production, especially in grain, we definitely need to cultivate more land. A lot of people subscribe to that school of thought. Uh, I don't. I think we should use the land that we have to produce more. But 
you said something. Uh, the what? What does it take to produce a k kilogram of of beef? Oh, 25 kilograms of of uh, grains and soybeans. So exactly. 25. So that means 25 kilograms of grain is in competition. Uh, you know, in in terms of being either used to feed a starving family or to feed uh, a cow that will give you one kilogram of beef. Yeah. So you can imagine there's, there's, there's quite a scenario here. And I definitely believe innovation uh, like yours in, in agritech would definitely lower the demand for grain uh, going towards uh, feeding animals rather than uh, being consumed by, by I wholeheartedly him. agree. <laughs> <laughs> and how do farmers fit into Meetable's mission? Um, well, actually, we're trying to help farmers in a way that um, the bigger farms currently where they have thousands of herd to lower that amount and they can take better care of their animals. I think organic farming is wonderful and we should definitely a thing that we should keep doing. But we really try to combat the big, huge mega farms where the animals have poor lives, where they're standing in mud and in manure and have a terrible infection rate among the animals and need to antibiotics to stay healthy for their short life that they have. That's the market that we would try to mitigate. The organic farms is wonderful, but you cannot feed the planet through organic farming. It's just not feasible. So this is, this is how farmers uh, fit in. They can reduce, hopefully reduce their herd, but still have an increased amount of money per, uh, per cow, because I think uh, through subsidies, the, amount, the cost of meat is way too low. The real cost is paid in environmental burden. Um, so we hopefully can raise the, the price of meat to make it more reflective of what it actually costs and have farmers take better care of their animals and their environment where they're in. So this way helping them. Yeah. So in addition to the environmental benefits, um, you've also mentioned that there's, you can add nutrients to the meat mm. as you grow it um, mm. and you, you can prevent diseases and prevent those um, antibi antibiotic effects. Um, could you speak to how, how that works at Minimum. Right, right, so there's two things. So one is the antibiotic issue. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily bad to give animals antibiotics. It's just that their uh, natural occurring bacteria become resistant to these antibiotics and might cause infection in the population. Our method is completely antibiotic free because you're using a sterile environment where to grow these cells in. They need to be perfectly happy and clean, only providing the nutrients that they need to start growing. So no antibiotics needed. Uh, the other thing is that we can decide what to give these cells, what type of amino acid, what types of salt, and really control the process of what nutrient value the final product will have. So we can have meats in the future with higher protein content, lower fat content, different types of fat, different types of flavors, and really customize the final product how we want it to be as a as a form of personalized nutrition. Having elderly, having special diets, having athletes with special nutritional requirements, really customizing the meat and redefining what meat can actually be in the future. Yeah. So we're gonna take a couple questions from the audience now. Um, so how, how do you create a business out of a social cause like food waste or in the environmental impact of, of food production? I think uh, business is the greatest avenue for change. And I believe that uh, if you're able to identify a genuine problem that affects people, then uh, you're definitely solving a, a social uh, problem. And what you have is a social solution. Um, uh, so it, it, it's incredibly powerful to identify problem uh, at the minute level to actually see what is wrong to find the pain points and to no matter how simple or complex it is as simple as giving data and as complex as growing meat in a lab you need to be able to answer that question you know to to provide a remedy for that pain point uh, and once you do that i believe you have a, a, a social enterprise do you have anything to add Sorry, can you repeat the question? How, how, do, you, how do you build a business around a social cause? But like it's it's not really a social food. cause for us, right? It's yeah. more a food production system that you're, which you're inserting yourself into. It's not really a social cause. Um, at least I don't view it as such. 
I really think this is just an environmental cost what yeah. you're looking into. And it's much easier to make a business around an environmental cost than it is about a social cost. I, I think so. I, I don't know if you agree with that. but Well, I don't agree. I, <laughs> I, I <laughs> great, great. <laughs> Tell me why. I, I think you are solving a, a, a massive social problem. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people who, uh, because of this problem, do not consume uh, beef. And, and feel, uh, you know, animals have a right and feel animals should not be treated as such. And, and they're right, because when you see the conditions in which uh, uh, beef is uh, provided on our tables, uh, I mean, the journey it takes to get there, it's, it's perilous for, for anyone to experience. Now, think of also of the, 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 the protein need of the world. Uh, there are a lot of people who do not have access to a balanced diet simply because all they have is grain. They actually have no access to meat. That is a social problem. So. Right. Uh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I can see your point. That's great. Yeah. Actually, I, that's a new insight for me. I was really <laughs> doing this for the environmental reasons mainly. I, I still like to enjoy some meat once in a while. Um, but I really feel ambivalent about eating it, right? I, I know it's bad, but it's just... I, for some reason, it's very hard to kick the habit. And I, you can see this also in the population. I think the latest numbers in Western society has been uh, five to eight percent of people are vegetarian and vegan, so combined. Mm -hmm. That's very few people, right? Yeah. That's very few people. Yeah, it's, so hard, to, people, it's hard to cut it out of your Yeah, and yeah, people, really if you ask them, say, oh, well, do you know about the problems that it's causing? They know about it, but they still uh, decide that it adds so much value to their life that they consider eating it. So quickly to wrap up, when you're working on solving big, huge problems like how we're going to produce enough food, how we're going to mitigate the impact of climate change, how do you combat that kind of founder burnout or depression when you feel like you're not moving fast enough? Um, what is it that inspires you to keep going? Well, for me, uh, it's, it's, it's been you know, the typical entrepreneurial journey with its uh, typical ups and downs. And, and every time I go down, I remember that you know, someone actually has to do something. And if in, in 10 years, uh, you are able to look back and see that, you know, you, you were at the hem of, you know, the, the scratch that started the brush fire that changed the world, then you would have been fulfilled. But if you allowed the downs to take you down and be nowhere in 10 years, then you wouldn't have had a mark on the world. Uh, yeah. and, and that gets me going. Oh, it's, it's easy for me because I'm super passionate about science. So I can finally do something where I can do extreme good, uh, potential good for the world and practice science and be an entrepreneur. It, it's basically a dream come true for me. So every day I, I get to go to work. Yeah. It never feels like I'm going to work. Being here That's is a privilege. And every day I feel yeah. privileged being able to do this work and that actually I'm gonna, I can get uh, I can pay my rent by doing this. It's yeah. just amazing to me. That's that the is, dream. Yeah, right. Well, thank it, you so much to both thank of you, you for being here. And thank uh, thanks for joining us today. Enjoy your second day of Slush. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.